et cetera. Now it's Charles Emmons, who's a sociologist, and I think he's going to help us uh, with a different kind of perspective on some of these questions. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Is alternate healing science? Is it paranormal? Is it spiritual? Thank you very much, Gettysburg College, for the research money. I got interested in this starting in 2013 when Jack Hunter, the editor of Pair Anthropology, led a group of us to the Esalen Institute for a conference on survival. Esalen is a great place to study altered states of consciousness. You can get into one yourself in the, the hot tub, the communal hot tub. And you can also study alternative medicine. A couple of really good books on the culture of Esalen are Jeff Kripal's Esalen, America and the Religion of No Religion, and David Kaiser's How the Hippies Saved Physics. So here we are at the Center for Theory and Research talking about evidence for survival. And at the end, Deb Frost, one of the major donors, said, how do we get this stuff about consciousness into the culture? What are some practical implications? Sound familiar? Consilience. Aha, I had a sabbatical title before I had a research design. Paranormal practice, using the unusual. OK, then what would that be? I remembered Dean Radin telling me in an interview that he was moving toward publishing more in medical journals. And I thought about Sarah Machian's book, Everyday Spirituality, in which she talks about how individuals take this and that from here and there to fill their own needs in their own personal lives. Sarah studied three spiritualist churches in Stoke-on-Trent in the West Midlands in England, and I thought, I could do that. I've studied spiritualist churches, and this would be a good way to start a snowball sample of spiritual healers. I ended up interviewing 53 people and doing lots of participant observation in the UK, in England, and Wales, and in the United States in different places in Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio. I have previous research that relates to this. Guided by Spirit is about spirit mediums, and Science and Spirit is about consciousness, both of those with my wife Penelope. And then Chinese Ghosts, this is the 2017 revised edition. They all have something to do with spiritual healing. And for this project, I have a chapter, Paranormal Medicine, in Daryl Caterine's edited volume, The Paranormal and Popular Culture for Rutledge. I do a sociology of knowledge, so I want to find out what's going on with the mainstream and how they manage the medically mysterious, but especially I emphasize what's happening with practitioners and users. So my main research question is, what is considered scientific, paranormal, or spiritual about alternative medicine, uh, both for the, you know, the mainstream, integrative, and the, um, the more spiritual practitioners and users. This is not my question. Does it work, and how does it work? But if you're curious about that, and who isn't, then you could read sociologist Mary Ruggie's history of attempts to test alternative medicines. And the, methodological problems in doing that. You could see how transcendental meditation came out of a spiritual tradition, but then got studied scientifically in the lab at Harvard, starting in 1968 with Dr. Herbert Benson. Now, later on, he did talk about spiritual aspects of meditation, but that's not what he was doing to begin with. You could also read sociologist Bill Bankston and how he deals with healing, hands-on healing of mice with cancer in the laboratory. You could read Beverly Rubick. If you're a healer, she'll put you in a small dark space and measure the photons coming out of your energy fingers. You could read Iman Sbarus. So for example, with Julia Mossbridge, he wrote Transcendent Mind, and part of that talks about the meta-analyses that support the efficacy of long-distance healing, distance healing. You could read sociologist Jim McLennan, 
wondrous healing in which he explains shamanic healing in terms of placebo and hypnotizability. What I do is look at the importance of the, the sociological, anthropological context of this. Placebo is partly a social phenomenon that will have an impact on whatever objectively might be happening. And also, legitimacy and beliefs of practitioners are going to have an impact on what is actually used. The phrase alternative medicine is already culturally relative. So that I interviewed a woman from Peru who said, this isn't alternative. This is just our medicine. This is our indigenous medicine. We don't consider it alternative. Acupuncture, in a Chinese context, is not alternative medicine. It's part of traditional Chinese scholarly scientific medicine. And even between the United States and the UK, <coughs> midwifery is rather alternative in the United States, but not in England, especially not in Wales. We could look at this at the ma macro level and the micro level. At the macro, we'd look at the institution of medicine and medical schools and medical journals. <coughs> On the micro level, we would be looking at what individual practitioners, what individual, excuse me, what individual practitioners and users do, and that's my emphasis. <coughs> In the institution of medicine, we move from alternative to complementary to integrative which in, indicates, in some way, a kind of progression toward a greater incorporation into the mainstream. And we would look at what's happening with the National Institutes of Health. And when we notice that both Harvard and Yale have integrative medicine in the medical schools, we know something's happening. But it's far from equal. So, there's still negative stuff in medical journals about alternative medicine, and a lot of the spiritual things are just reframed as placebo. And if you are going to get alternative procedures, a lot of times they're done by volunteers. So for example, in one hospital I observed, before going into surgery, yes, you could get essential oils, but they would be administrated, administered by a volunteer and not by somebody of higher professional status. So again, I want to know what's happening with uh, people who see it as scientific, how is that being legitimated, but also want to see the spiritual that is more important to a lot of uh, alternative practitioners and users. Uh, you're going to say I told you so, but <laughs> I found that not many people could respond to framing things in terms of the paranormal. For one thing, they would associate the paranormal with goofy pop culture images of ghosts and see how it was relevant to what I was asking. Or they would say, the paranormal is tomorrow's science. Or they would say, the paranormal is already today's science. We can explain these things scientifically, they thought, in terms of quantum physics or subtle energies. Here's somebody who used all three perspectives, science, paranormal, and spiritual. This is Ed Edwards who says he does bio-intrinsic resonant energy work. And the scientific part, according to him, is that he manipulates electrical energies. But he says there's a paranormal part because when he's tested in parapsychology labs, he's able to control uh, instruments at a distance while he's inside a Faraday box. But he also explains things spiritually. He said that he gets his powers from the source, sort of generic spiritual source. I can give you examples of people who see what they're doing in healing as non-spiritual and agnostic. Some that say it's all science. I'll give you examples from Qigong, from Bill Bankston, and a homeopathic doctor. So that if you're training to be a Qigong practitioner, you will be told that this is all science, and you're not told that it's spiritual. Um, there's probably exceptions to that, but the people I interviewed said that. Bill Bankston said there's nothing spiritual about his healing, and he said it doesn't matter if the students who come into his lab to, to try the hands-on healing believe in it or not. So that's really fascinating to me, people who, who look at supposedly spiritual healing and say it's not spiritual. I interviewed a Norwegian homeopathic doctor who used to take care of the English 
soccer legend Gordon Banks. And this Norwegian homeopathist said, what I do is entirely scientific, but a number of my Norwegian colleagues think there's a spiritual component, but he saw it all as science. So a lot of what's going on here is despiritualization, we could call it. It's like Max Weber's disenchantment or secularization of the modern world, the decline of mysticism. So that you see secular yoga that doesn't have very much that's spiritual about it. Maybe a little namaste here and there, and that's about it. Or secular, secular meditation, you know, like, kind of like uh, uh, Herbert Benson. He wasn't seeing it as spiritual when he started out. Now, here we come to what Larry Dossie would call consilience interruptus, because we've learned so much about the amazing things that happened with placebo in the last five or 10 years that it's pretty ignorant in mainstream medicine to deny the, the body mind spirit, uh, excuse me, the body mind connection. But when it comes to body mind spirit, what do you do with spirit? Well, let's not fight about this, let's just call it all placebo and we'll avoid the consilience. Some people I interviewed took a totally rational frame, even when they had marvelous experiences. So this one woman says she's a skeptic, and she and her father have what look like mystical experiences in nature or haunting experiences in historic sites. And she says the two of them talk about it as feeling the energy. You can feel the energy in this place. She and her husband have an Egyptian fertility cloth that they put above the bed in the guest room. And they say there are three women who have gotten pregnant sleeping in that bed whose doctors told them they couldn't possibly get pregnant. So the woman and her husband laugh about this. They don't believe in it, but they recommend it. <laughs> there are practitioners who say, well, you know, uh, maybe my clients experience something spiritual, sort of an add-on effect, some sort of placebo effect. I do massage, and that's scientific, but I don't know what's going on. You know, maybe spiritual, intuitive things happen among my clients. One skeptic says, you know, yoga and meditation, those are medical. But actually, our instructor asks us to imagine that we're filling up with spirit. Maybe there's something else going on. I found it's really important what the audience is when these practitioners are talking. So for example, a high percentage of chiropractors in the United States are conservative Christians. And one that I interviewed said, when I'm talking in my congregation, I tell them that I'm working with the Holy Spirit. But I don't say that to MDs or other chiropractors or even my clients unless they want to talk about something spiritual. Some people say they're spiritual, but they don't really know the process. They don't know exactly what's happened. They just kind of feel it. There's some sort of feedback. Uh, and there's a ritual or a method that takes care of it, but they don't really know. So in this crystal shop in Stoke, here's my friend Tony from Hong Kong. People call him up and ask him, what do I use for, what kind of stone do I use for a certain ailment? And he'll, and he'll just, something will pop into his head. And he says, he's curious. He'll look it up later. He doesn't know much about the stones. I asked him, what would be something that I could give my friend back in Gettysburg? He walked in the back room, pulled out a drawer, gave me a nondescript looking flat brown stone. I said, okay. I took it to my friend. She said, oh my God, that's my favorite stone. I've lost mine. I thought I'd never see another one again. Some people say it's all spiritual. I asked one Reiki practitioner, do you think that Someday we'll be able to explain scientifically what all this is that happens with your energy healing. She says, gosh, I hope not. That would spoil it. That's kind of the Mysterian view. It's a mystery. Let's keep it that way. One, one uh, spiritualist I interviewed said, let's leave the scientists out of this, which is not a typical spiritualist response because spiritualism is supposed to be a combination of science, philosophy, and religion. There, sometimes there's like a, a generic connection that healers say they have, especially spiritualist healers that I know. And there's some kind of intuition going on. They don't know what it is. They're guided somehow, and they, but they also improvise. So that some people, they say they just know where to put their hands. I'm a spiritualist healer myself, and I, can, I know what that means. You know, I'll find myself lingering on a shoulder. I find out later that was the, where the problem was. 
These are two Reiki practitioners who work on horses and people like me. And the three of us compared notes about what we thought was going on while they were healing me. And we all had different kinds of feelings, intuitive notions of what was happening. If you want to become a healer, you'll take a Reiki class, Qigong class, spiritualist healing class, and you have a theory and a method, but there's tremendous variation in what people actually do and how they describe what they think is going on. In England, spiritualist churches have very rigid notebooks of pictures of where you're supposed to put your hands and where you're not supposed to put your hands. And, but the healers told me, we don't go by that. <laughs> Spirit mediums have rules about how they're supposed to connect. And uh, Penelope and I, on the left, Penelope on the left, are, uh, do phenomenological subjective studies of how mediums do what they do in the book Guided by Spirit, whereas Julie Beischel does mostly objective laboratory studies with MRIs and so on. But Julie is in, you know, at the Winbridge Research Center. But she's also incorporating some subjective measures, which I think is really good, the, those comparisons. That's the wave of the future for studying mediumship. Both mediums and healers say that they have often spirit guides. And there are rules against connecting the mediumship with the healing, but actually they go together. I mean, I've experienced that myself. And there are rules in Lilydale, where the spiritualist community, about, you know, don't mix these things, don't pretend you're a doctor. One of the mediums says she visualizes the Pillsbury doughboy and somebody poking the doughboy where there's a physical problem, and she'll tell the sitter in a private reading that she should check it out. There are also prayer circles, uh, all kinds of other things that you could study. In a big study of spiritualism, uh, you could see there's social support, placebo effects. We could study healing at a distance. There's all kinds of things going on there that really connect mediumship and healing. So in conclusion, there's a tendency to rationalize a lot of healing in some kind of a theory. And there's a, a move toward the scientific framing of things. But there's a great variety of practices so that the general theories about how these things work, whether it's scientific or spiritual theory, really don't capture the everyday spirituality of all these healing behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And we have time for some questions. Uh, maybe I missed it, but could you define spirit and could you define the difference between spiritual healing and electromagnetic healing with a device? No, I can't, but that's up to my, the people that I interview. See, I want to know how they look at it. Now, I could give you a, a variety of statements of what people say about what spirit is, and their theories about how it works, but it varies tremendously. But I'm not studying how it works, see, and I'm not defining it. I'm letting the people I interview define it. I mean, I can tell you what I think, but that's not relevant to what I'm talking about. But what do I think spirit is? I don't know. I think it's consciousness and that it's a mystery that we're, that we're working on. I mean, that's as much as I know. And, uh, and I don't know about, I mean, I'm curious about all the, the energy explanations, information explanations, but uh, that's not my specialty either. But I appreciate the, I appreciate the question. When you've interviewed healers who refer to science, are they doing that uh, primarily for pragmatic reasons, do you find, or for reasons to try to understand what's happening? I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about when healers are referring to science uh, specifically, or scientific data. My impression is that most of them don't care very much about the scientific explanation. They may be curious, and they know what they've been told about how to do things, and they give sort of a kind of a fun, generic discussion uh, of that. They'll talk about it philosophically, but I don't think they look to it very specifically for how to do things. And some of them really worry that they're not doing it according to the rules. And they ask their teachers and they say, you're great, don't worry about it. There's a tremendous amount of intuition rather than rational uh, ways of doing things. Yeah. Very interesting. You know, the older I get, the more I think that humans attribute all sorts of reasons to th things, but nature just is. Uh, and that's in physics, yeah. in psychic phenomena, in right. healing, and so on. 
It's, I, why, are, why are we as human beings always trying to attribute causes to things when we really don't? They could be multiple causes. Everything happen, causes everything. See, I'm a healer, a spiritual healer. And if, if I have to decide between science and intuition, I'll take science. But this is new for me, being a spirit medium and a healer, and I'm just sort of in awe of it. And I'd like to have some answers, you know, what is spirit and all that. But uh, I know what it feels like now, and the experiential part is really important to understand how this works. I mean, you, to feel how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm not a Mysterian, though. I want to know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting talk. My question has to do with um, the, the search for mechanistic explanations for what's going on mm -hmm. and how in a clinical situation sometimes we benefit from having more degrees of freedom for change. And so the error term actually may be where our friend is. Um, that I, I've found over time, I, I'm a, a clinical psychologist mm -hmm. and I use a lot of biofeedback and low-level laser and just some of these mm -hmm. emergent technologies in my work. Right. I don't introduce them all at once, but very often I'll have more than one thing going on with people, and it seems like the outcomes are greater, that somehow there's a synergy, mm -hmm. and um, the willingness to live with the mystery for the mechanism that's underlying the change yeah. actually seems to work to our benefit, and I wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, you have to have the intention. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I have the intention, and I kind of let go. But a couple things. Uh, I think Bill Bankston is right, that it has a lot to do with the person being healed. I, and I think very few people, when they come in the healing temple in Lilydale, think that they have anything to do with it. But I, and also when people get readings, it has a lot to do with the sitter. I've noticed that, that some people I just can't read. And so it's, uh, it, I don't know, I kind of lost my train on the other part of your question, but. Uh, oh, that was good, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Thanks.